<laughs> uh, with the students, those who are. So, um, let me just remind you of some elementary things just uh, as a warm up for, to what is going to come now. So, the warm up is the following. Suppose you have a Brownian motion. in the interval 0, 1. Or maybe let's take 0 pi. Maybe take 0, 2 pi is better. Right? You just have a Brownian motion. Yt. And you know the Brownian motion stays, starts somewhere y0 is pi, for instance, but it can start from any other place. And I asked the question, what is the probability that y stays in the interval 2 pi, 0 to pi up to time t? You know, t is very large. How does the probability that uh, the one-dimensional Brownian motion stays in an interval uh, for a long time, how does this decay with t? Of course, this is extremely classical, so I'm not. Uh, but I just, because we are going to do basically the same a bit later on, except that it's not a brand new. So, 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 of course, you know, during each time interval, zero of, of length one, you know, you take a brown motion in, that starts from zero somewhere in this interval. During that time of interval one, it may go out. So immediately you, you, you get to you know that this probably will decay exponentially fast with time. And the question is at what, which speed? Okay. How do you estimate this probability? So either you are you know, uh, already acquainted to this type of uh, little bit of functional analysis or harmonic, I mean, element, this is really elementary. Uh, it's just you know you have to, the speed at which this will go to zero will be exponential to minus lambda t, where lambda is the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian uh, in the interval 0 to pi uh, with boundary, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's how you would do it, uh, you know, if you want just to say, well, that's, right? So, and you will, there, therefore, you know, it will decay like e to the minus, so what is the first eigenvalue here? It's uh, 1 half, probably, because the first eigenvalue will be uh, sinus x over 2 or something. So one way to view this, to, if you want to prove this you know, without, refer, I mean, without referring to any uh, theory or whatever, is to say, well, instead of starting with zero to, at uh, this, imagine that you start with initial distribution uh, sinus x over 2. So this is the density with which you start. That means at time 0, you know, you choose, you have 0 to pi, and you choose the starting point with that density. So if you choose plenty of starting points, that, you know, you will see this type of picture with that many particles sitting at each uh, side here. Now, what is going to happen is that uh, e to the minus uh, t sinus x over 2, so if you define f of t x, so maybe uh, so is the eigenvalue 1 or 1 fourth or 2 pi, is it 1 fourth maybe, is it 4, help me. So in other words, let's, let's do it this way. If you say yxt 
right? This is a Brownian motion started on x at time zero, right? And you're going to define f of t x, this expected value, right, of a decatur function uh, of uh, y did not exit before t times sinus uh, y x t over 2. So what you see is that at time zero, right, when t is zero, this quantity is just sinus y over two. Right? So you can interpret this as the distribution, you know, at at time uh, at time zero. So because y t x is x. Now here you can apply you can apply the sort of uh, Markov uh, uh, property. Here you can apply the, the Markov property, and just using the fact that y is a Brownian motion, what you will end up with is just the fact that when you look at sort of how this guy evolves, right, you will find the second derivative of this that will show up, and you will find something like e to the minus that. Uh, okay. Something like this is equal to four times. Uh, f of t x, something like that. Four times Laplace with respect to x. Okay, now I am completely. Okay. I wanted to make it simple. Okay, but anyway, so may, let, let's just put it this way. As a simple exercise, you will get probably that you get something like this. That you will get that at time zero, this is the distribution that you have, right? And that this sinus x over 2, the fact that this is the, the first, I mean, that this is the eigenvalue. So if you look at the Laplacian, yeah, you'll get Laplacian of u is just, you know, minus 1 fourth times uh, u of x. And because of that, you will see that this will solve, you know, that if you define e to the minus uh, t over 4, uh, u over x, this will solve the fact that this will solve partial difference. This equals to Laplacian u. Okay. And so if you apply this, and it has initial value u of t 0, which is a sinus x over 2. So, and you can check that this is, has the same interpretation as that. So all I'm saying is that what you look at is that you have this Laplacian that plays, is related to the Brownian motion here that tells you basically what, how this thing is evolving inside the interval 0 to pi. You start with that initial, if you start with this initial distribution, that what, the distribution that you see at time t will just be, you know, and there's a factor of 2 missing. Okay, anyway, because, because it's Laplacian over 2. In principle, it should be something like that. We should take here eight. Anyway, the distribution you see at time t is just that you have, you know, many of them will have gone out, uh, gone out, but you will still see the same shape, right? Except that it's sort of uh, multiplied by a factor minus t over eight. Okay. So if I start with the sinus shape. Sinus wave, and some point this one will go down, you know, because it's an eigenvector. I mean, the uh, eigenvector of the Laplacian, and it will, you know, go out at that speed, which gives you e to the minus t over eight. So what you see, the the the, and of course, this e to the minus t over eight is also what is going to govern what happens if you start from, say, the middle. Because of symmetry, you know, you know anyway that it will be better for you to start 
from the middle to start anywhere uh, nearer to the boundary. Right? So you know that the, this probability anyway will be larger than e to the minus t over h, which is the probability that if you have started randomly with respect to the sinus x over 2 choice that you have exited. Okay? And conversely, this will be, you know, it's easy to see that this will be smaller than a constant times e minus t over 8, and there's plenty of ways to see this. One way would just be to say, well, okay, let us first, you know, uh, uh, start with e to the minus t over 8, uh, I mean, with the sinus x over 2 thing here. Okay? With positive, if I start with this initial distribution, with positive probability before time 1, you know, I start with this sinus x over 2, Maybe, you know, with some probability, the starting point is here. And when the starting point is here, then with some positive probability, everything is fixed. You know, the Brownian motion here will hit the middle before time one without exiting. This will happen with positive probability. And then, the problem, basically, if, so you first hit the middle before time one, and then you want... Uh, not to get out here. So basically, if you, if you take t minus 1 here over 8, and this will be the constant to be uh, the probability that, you know, after hitting the middle, you have to, to still not to go, to, uh, to go out, we just have to bound, uh, a bound like this. Does that make sense? I'm too fast, maybe not very clear. I'm just saying, you know, you know what the probability is if you start with this initial distribution, you know the probability to go out uh, before time t is exactly e to the minus t over 8. I mean, the probability not to go out before time t is exactly e to the minus t over 8. So this gives you a, a, a lower bound if you start from the middle, because the middle is the best point to start from. But it also gives you a, a, an upper bound to start from the middle, because you know that if I start, say, uh, some, if I start randomly here, there's one strategy which consists of first hitting the middle, and this will happen with before time one with a given probability, and then the probability not to go out will be anyway uh, bounded from above by what you need. So you can compare, you know, up to constants, the probability to start from the middle, from anywhere, then the probability start with this initial distribution here. So, So this argument tells you, you know, that you don't have to know, I mean, invoke any, you know, deep result. You could invoke simple, you know, functional analysis result to justify what I just uh, justified. But this was just, you know, to convince you that the fact that if you know the first eigenvalue of, of your uh, Laplacian, I mean, first eigenvalue, first eigenvector, this first eigenfunction, the fact that then wherever you, for which, whichever, you know, point you fix in the inside, that you have an upper bound and a lower bound up to multiplicative constants, but still with the, with the same order, you know, e to the minus t over 8, for the probability not to go out of the interval, this is basically, you know, you have it for free, because you know that if you start with initial distribution given by the eigenfunction, then this is the right order, and therefore, and then you can just, you know, change slightly time by a factor of one or something like that in order to randomize the, the starting point wherever you, you start and compare it with this initial distribution. So why did I, okay, just make, there's one little remark that you can make also, which is that imagine now that the Brownian motion here runs uh, between zero to pi, but also that you have, instead of saying, that here you, you, you kill it when it hits 2 pi, you make you reflect it at 2 pi. Right. Then basically just because of a simple reflection argument, the probability not to, you know, that this guy which is reflected here never hits 0 is the same that this guy where you sort of extend this by reflection all over to 4 pi, you know, by making some symmetry like this, does not hit either 0 or 2 pi. Okay, so in that case, the eigenvalue will not be eigenvalue of the Laplacian with directly bounded condition, but 
you could say here, Dirichlet here and Neumann here, because this will be, because of the symmetry, this would mean that these things, you know, have zero derivatives here in the middle. Okay, but we come back to that a little bit later. So, so that was just, you know, warm up to before everybody came in into the room, an improvised warm up, and uh, became too, way too long. But so, what do we have now? We have uh, radial SLE, and the question is going to be the following. So here I have my curve gamma t. I have my map ft, zero here, normalized by the derivative at the origin, xi t. And the equation is partial differential with respect to t of ft of z is minus ft of z, ft of z plus xi t, divided by ft of z minus xi t. Xi t is e to the i times Brownian motion running at speed six times t. Okay. Maybe we we already use some square root of six times beta t is going to be more convenient here. It's the same, of course. Now we are interested in the first. Our first question is. What is the probability that the disconnection time we referred before, you know, what is the probability that the first time we're going to disconnect minus one from zero is larger than t? Right. What is the probability that then uh, gamma up to time t does not disconnect zero from minus one? where the time here is the time for the guy seen from zero, right? It's not the caudal time seen from minus one, it's the radial time seen from zero. We use the radial time because this is comparable to the distance from the origin. So that's the right object to look at. So this is just the probability. So what happens, you know, when this disconnects? What happens is that at that moment, minus one, or ft of minus one, hits xi t. That's what happens. Right? Because when you close up things, this guy, you know, is behind this. You have to, in order to view minus one, you have to go through this fjord, and this fjord is cut, is, is you know, uh, closing up. So this image of this point is between the image of this point and the image of this point. When they close up, these two guys come in close, and so the guy behind comes close also. So this is the probability that f uh, uh, of z, let's put this ft of z, ft of minus 1, is still defined at time t. Right? This is that this explosion time for this guy has not occurred at time t. Now, let's look at what, it, what this means exactly. What this means exactly is that we want to keep track not only of gamma t and xi t, but we want also to have here ft of minus 1. And so our question is, Is ft of minus 1, you know, going to hit xi either in this direction or in that direction? So let us write what happens to uh, So let's say that ft of minus 1 is e to the i times, uh, say, yt. Right. Because we want, of course, it's on the still, it will remain on the unit circle, so let's write it in this angular form. So here, of course, what you have is the derivative respect to time of ft. And since this is an exponential of y, you will want to put the, you know, to say that this is, that you have the derivative with respect to t of log ft of z which is equal to uh, minus 
ft of z plus xi, t divided by ft of z minus xi. And so, uh, what do you want, how do you want to interpret this? Uh, well, there's an i, if you put an i there, you put an i here, and then you recognize something which is a cotangent here. Yes? You have two guys on the unit circle. If you divide everything by, you know, here you divide here and there by square root of uh, ft of z plus square root of xi t here and there. So what you get immediately out of this is just that the derivative with respect to t of y t is just cotangent of uh, y t minus theta t or something like that, divided by 2. This, this is just, you know, you rewrite this equation, which is a smooth thing, how it shows on, up on the circle. And the fact that it's cotangent, you know, should not surprise you, because in, in, the, in the Leuvenet equation on the boundary, this was the quantity which was 2 over z. No. And so on the circle, the most natural thing is not 1 over z, uh, as it would be on the real line. It would be cotangent of half of this thing. So if you write now zt to be yt minus theta t, what you end up with is that dzt is going to be minus square root of 6 times d beta t, because theta t, right, this is this uh, Brown motion of square root of 6 times beta t plus, or maybe there's a factor of 2 here, no, so maybe it's just cotangent of zt over 2 dt. So that's the equation that plays the role of um, uh, of the equation that we had in the, in the caudal case, which was d of gt of z minus wt was equal to minus dwt plus 2 over gt of z minus wt. So this was some Bessel equation, and this is a circular Bessel equation, if you want. These type of interaction are the most natural one that you can put on the unit circles, you know, as repelling force on the unit circle, this is the type of things you, you see all over the place in random matrices or whatever. So. Anyway, so Z follows this equation. Z is just this angle here, seen on this side. So it starts at Z0 equals pi. And the question we are asking is just exactly the probability that Z does, did not hit 0 to pi before time t. OK, we have just transformed. Our initial question is some question having to do with the exploration process, and it's a particularly simple uh, statement. OK, so it's almost the same as what we had before, except that we don't have just, you know, if, if z would just be, you know, uh, if we wouldn't have this drift term, it would be just the same question as before, you know, the probability that the Brownian motion stayed in an interval. So here we have a drift term, and the drift term is um, doing something strange, if you think about it, what is going to happen is that there's some repelling force forcing you to go more to the 
center, roughly speaking, that's what happens to this recurring force. Okay. So you, the more you get closer to zero to pi, the more you know you are pushed to the inside. So it's not so easy to get to the boundary of the unit circle, uh, to, 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 to get to zero to pi. Actually, what is happening, and it's exactly like what was happening in the discrete case, if here I would have kept kappa, right? if kappa is too small, then the repelling force you know, will be so strong that z will never make it all the way to the boundary, to 0 to pi. Exactly like a Bessel process, you know, when the repelling force is, is, uh, is too large, it will not make it uh, correspond to the fact that the dimension of the Bessel is too large, it will never make it to the, to the boundary. So this corresponds to the fact that when kappa is smaller than 4, the curve is simple, right? And so this disconnection time will never happen. So this z will anyway stay inside the interval. However, it just so happens that if you increase just the value of kappa, so, you know, it sort of wiggles more, then at some exceptional times, you know, it will be able to beat this uh, drift, because you see that this drift here blows up when you get close to the boundary. You know, you are forced, you know, the, but maybe, you know, the, the brown motion, you know, gets a very quick push to the, to the right, and so quick, you know, that the, the force doesn't, the linear force doesn't have time, you know, to re really repel it. That's the idea. So, so it's, it's easy, you know, by comparison to with, with sort of one-dimensional vessel processes or whatever, to see that as soon as kappa is larger than 4, you know, the, 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 this oscillation will be able to beat this, uh, the, self, the repelling and the drift force. So that indeed, the, the probability that this stays in that interval will decay exponentially fast with time, and, and you'll raise the question, okay, how fast? So what you are interested in is, is the eigen, I mean, eigen, the first eigenfunction. of the operator that to a function, uh, let's call it uh, u, uh, associates so what? So it's uh, uh, kappa over 2u double prime of x of this phi plus cotangent phi over 2 times u prime of phi. So you just replace Laplacian by Laplacian plus this drift. And with boundary conditions, uh, so with phi, uh, no, with the function that to the function u associates this one. And the, <coughs> uh, what did I, and the boundary conditions, of course, will be u of 0 is u of 2 pi is 0, because you are killed when you hit the boundary. So you're just trying to find, you know, if you imagine that you can find a positive function u that plays the role of the sine curve that we had before. So the idea is we want to find some u, a positive function. If you can find a positive function, then we are done, because that will be necessarily the first eigenfunction, such that uh, u kappa over 2 u double prime plus cotangent of phi over 2 times u prime is 0, uh, is equal to lambda u. Sorry. For some lambda, then we are done. Because then we can use this function to start with, you know, as our initial distribution. And we will immediately get that e to the minus lambda t times u will be, you know, the distribution after time t of, of, of the, if you apply the evolution by z to this initial distribution. And so it so happens that because, of course, here this is the simplest, uh, fun I mean, the simplest, you know, equation you could imagine in, on the unit circle, should not surprise you that in some, some sense the function u that you get here is the simplest one you could imagine. Right? So actually the simplest function will be u of phi is going to be sinus phi over 2. That's what would have happened if I, that would have been just no drift. Right? But we put it to some power. 
and the power would de depend on theta, but here the natural power to put is one third. This one third is actually the one coming from Smirnov's theorem. But so if you just write what happens here, you do this expansion, right? And you get that if you take uh, u of phi being sinus phi to the one third, uh, you do the second derivative. Okay, you have to. Do it's slightly more complicated than differentiating twice uh, the sinus, but everything you know will just uh, come out nicely. You have sine squared plus cos squared, which is one, so which makes life uh, nice. And actually, you don't even need this one. OK, anyway. So uh, what you end up with is just that this solves this with lambda being equal to uh, equal to, so maybe here I want to put a minus lambda, one-fourth. Okay. So what this will tell you, so you just check that this works. Okay. So what this will tell you that if I start, so if Z0 has initial distribution sinus x over 2 to the one third dx times some constant. Right. Then, if you look at the distribution of zt indicator function that zt hasn't exited the domain after time t, you get exactly e to the minus t over 4 times sinus x over 2 uh, to the one third. This will be the distribution you observe at time t later on. Okay? And exactly the same arguments I told you for the Brownian motion before that tells you that the best point to start with would be z0 equals pi. It right? tells you that this gives you a lower bound for the probability starting from pi to, to because of symmetry to survive after time t. And the upper bound up to constants gives you just by shifting by a factor of t equal 1. So the, the consequence of this that this quantity here, so probability that gamma up to time t does not disconnect d4 times t, minus 1 d4 times t, this will be larger than e to the minus t over 4 and smaller than some constant times e to the minus t over 4. So now let's move this back into our uh, uh, SLE framework, which is the one we want to apply it for. We know that time t, so let's say that t, let's define t of r. This is the first time at which SLE hits the circle of radius r. Okay. We have this uh, one quarter theorem that tells you, roughly speaking, that the first time at which SLE hits the circle of radius r, the distance okay, is then exactly r, and that the distance, 1 over the distance, was roughly e to the minus t. So what you get is that, uh, let's put this right, e to the minus tr, you know, is uh, uh, something like, let's do it carefully, uh, 4r and r of 4, it's just, just to be absolutely on the safe side. Okay. I put a 4 on each side to be sure not put it on the wrong one. And so therefore, what you end up is that t is comparable to log, I mean, t, the time at which this happens, sort of a smaller than log of a 1 over 4r and larger than log of 4r or something.
So therefore, if you say, what is the probability that gamma up to time tr does not disconnect, which is what we want, right? Does not disconnect uh, minus 1 from 0. So that's this two-arm event. And this will be smaller than the constant times e to the minus. Well, anyway, tr right, is larger than this. So if at tr it didn't happen, then necessarily at that time before it didn't happen either. So e to the minus 1 fourth log 4 over r. So, so this is just a constant times r to the 1 fourth. And similarly, on the other side, the probability that gamma up to time tr does not disconnect 0 from minus 1 will be larger than e to the minus 1 fourth log of uh, 1 over 4r, which is also constant times r to the 1 fourth. OK, so what we end up with here simply is the fact that if I take SLE 6 started from here, the probability that this guy, you know, makes it all the way to here without disconnecting this disk of radius r from minus 1 before time, uh, b, I mean, before and not before any time, just it hits this circle of radius r before disconnecting the circle from minus 1. This will decay like, roughly speaking, a constant or up to a constant like r to the 1 fourth when r goes to 0. Okay. So here we start seeing this uh, 1 fourth exponent. And then on Monday, I will show you how this one fourth, you know, this property of SLE can be transferred back into percolation by saying this is indeed the probability that you have two arms in discrete percolation going all the way to distance n, that this will decrease like 1 over n to the 1 fourth. Right. Now, let me just finish by making the following remark. Suppose that instead of looking at this question, we look at the question, which is, what is the probability that gamma from 0 tr does not discover a clockwise loop? Right. What is the probability that the guy that starts from here does not discover a loop like this. No, it does not disconnect. You know, here what we see is that there are two ways of disconnecting. Uh, okay, NT. Thank you. So you have two ways to disconnect 0 from, I mean, from uh, minus 1. One way to, would be to turn in one direction. The other way would be to turn the other direction. That corresponds to the fact that the fact that Z here, I mean, our diffusion guy, would hit 0 or would hit 2 pi. And, uh, and of course, here for our question, it was not relevant, but in terms of interpretation, remember of this one arm exponent, if you just look at whether there is this orange path, then the orange paths, you know, they will be prevented only by turning into one direction. So what you end up here in that picture will be that the corresponding question for the, for the, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for, in, for this question will be basically exactly the same as the one we started with, I mean, as what the one we studied, right? Except that, okay, we don't want basically our diffusion to hit zero. That's the wrong turn. But if it hits 2 pi, then we're very happy because that means that we have found the orange loop, no problem. So we can continue from there. 
So we can just continue. Because everything is orange on the boundary. So in some sense, Z, if you think about it, if you just look at the, the picture that we have here, we have your domain, which is here. We have zero here. Imagine that you color, that you start with, with some say that everything is orange here. Right? And we start gamma from here, this, this discovering thing. How do you interpret Z? Basically, what happens is that when you map this back by this conformal map, you have the disk here, and then you have one part of the boundary which corresponds to the orange one, and one part that corresponds to the blue one, seen from zero. So in other words, this guy here, which is, uh, okay, I did it the wrong direction, but that you can interpret as z. Oh, this would be 2 pi minus z. Okay, anyway, the, this sort of... Um, angle that you have here is basically the, po the blue portion seen from zero uh, correspond or as opposed to the orange one. So this will move, you know, you will explore, then you have more blue, more green, uh, more orange, more blue, more orange, and from time to time you close the loop, everything is orange, it's 2 pi, everything is blue, it's zero. So what you want is you don't want to close any clockwise loop, so you start with any, everything orange, and then you don't want to have everything blue. So in that case, the question is, you start from z equals 2 pi. So I did the picture a little wrong. You start here with 2 pi. When you are here, you, when you are between 0 and 2 pi, you evolve exactly as the z before, because it's the same equation. You are killed when you hit 0, because then that means that you have discovered a, a blue loop. You start everything orange. 2 pi is the angle of the orange part. And what the, the only question that you have to understand is what happens at 2 pi. But at 2 pi, basically, nothing happens. You just continue as, if, as, as from the beginning. So you're just gluing together you know, excursions away from 2 pi of this, of this, of this uh, diffusion. And so it's very easy to check. And this is done in the, in the notes, for instance, uh, uh, Park City notes, that when z hits 2 pi, this place is just reflected. You know, just bounce on two, away from 2 pi. So this corresponds here exactly to the fact that you are looking at the first eigenfunction of the same guy here, except that the boundary condition now is this is equal to 0, and the derivative at 2 pi is 0. That corresponds to a reflection corresponding to the fact that you are making your reflection all the way to 4 pi and asking where's the first time you exit from 4 pi. And exactly the same argument will go through. So except that here, OK, what is the simplest function, you know, type of function defined in 0, 4 pi, you know, uh, which takes value 0 at 0, 0 at 4 pi is positive in between. Uh, well, OK, so you take sinus phi over 4. The fact that you still have a 130 is anyway short argument to say that near the boundary it's always the same effect that plays into the game. It's just you know the speed at which when you are near the boundary you you are dissipated. So this is always going to be one 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 third. So you just check for this function. You know what is the lambda that shows up? It still show it still works, and you find here five over 48. So the probability that you do not discover any clockwise loop you know, before time t decays like e to the 5t over 48, e to the minus 5t over 48. So you can go back to r. And so everything that is, the only thing that is going to change is basically here that this will be roughly between constant r to the 5 over 48 another constant r times 5 over 48. So it's just the same argument, except that you replace this uh, hitting 0 to pi by just, on one side, you have a reflection. Okay? And there's no additional difficulty here to, to, to do this. So these are the two simplest uh, exponents that you can uh, compute, because they involve just one exploration. 
So uh, I will not. I will. I, I, I will have to stop almost in two minutes. But I just want to mention that. Say, imagine that you want to understand an event having to do with four arms. So you take a little r here. And intuitively, what you want is, what is the probability, if you have been to, to Christophe's lecture or to Pierre's lectures, you know that it's very important to understand you know, events like, what's the probability to have a picture like this? In discrete population. Because then that means that you know, to, in order to know if there's a blue crossing or a red crossing, you have to look at what happens inside this little piece. That means that this little piece will be important. So, and this only happens if you have these four arms that you have to look into there. So these four, these four arms are important. Now, how, of, how is there a way to see, understand this guy using an exploration process? The answer is uh, yes, but it's slightly more complicated than just looking at one guy up to the time at which it goes to the, hits the circle of radius R, because you start an exploration, say, from here, leaving blue on one side and red on the other one. So it will discover two arms. It will discover the, this red arm. It will discover this blue arm on its left. Right. But then there's the question, OK, now that I have discovered these two arms, you know, I still need to find the other two. You know, we have discovered a red guy here, a blue one here. What is the probability that now in the remaining domain there, is st there are still two other ones? Okay. So now it turns out that the natural thing to do is to say, well, imagine that, of course, R is going to be very small here. Imagine that I make it all the way to the circle of radius R. And so you will say, roughly speaking, that the event you're interested in is roughly saying that this that you discover these two arms, a red one and a blue one, then you are going to map the remaining domain, which is this guy, the white guy, right, onto a rectangle, for instance, just because it's a simply connected domain, where this piece is this part, and this piece outside is this other is this other part, right? And here you have a very long rectangle. Now, what you want is that in the remaining sort of rectangle, because R is very small here, this rectangle is very long. You want, want that in this remaining rectangle, roughly speaking, you have a still a blue crossing and a yellow and a green and a red crossing, which, because of conformal invariance, means that here you have a something here, and this you know, you know, by Smirnoff's result or whatever, that this will decay like, you know, if this rectangle has length L, L times pi, this will decay like e to the minus L, roughly speaking. You know this, you know, the disc, uh, because this is something you could compute. This is the probability that one exploration process started from here, you know, make, makes it all the way here and hits that before these pieces. So this is the type of thing you could compute by Smirnoff. So you know that if I have a remaining domain here, the probability to still have two arms will be something you can compute using this domain. And this something you can compute is actually something which is uh, very nice because it's also, and now I don't want to go too much into details, it is something that you can also interpret in terms of the derivative of the conformal map GT at that moment taken from here. Roughly speaking, this derivative of the conformal map GT taken here tells you basically how small, seen from zero, the, you know, uh, this interval you know, here will be squeezed by the conformal map GT. And intuitively, it's also something that tells you, you know, how small, you know, seen from here is that portion. So all I'm saying is that the natural, so I'm, it's not a proof, it's just, you know, hand-waving argument that says that in order to understand these type of four arms events, the thing you want to do is to say, I want to compute the expected value of the indicator function that you did not disconnect, you know, up to TR. So that's the fact that you have discovered the four arms. 
but then you still want two other arms. Right? And you know that the probability of these two other arms will be comparable to something that involves G prime, I mean F prime T of minus one uh, to some power. So here would be one in order to have the, the other arm. So you have to weight you know, the end configuration by saying now I, I still want you know, to, I, if I leave a lot of space here, I'm in much better shape to have four arms later. So this corresponds to the probability to have discovered these two things, and this corresponds roughly to the probability that in the remaining domain you still have found two arms. Now, and if you look at the evolution of this thing, so it's the evolution of the probability that something happens weighted by some uh, functional. And it turns out this functional, of course, is just, you know, can be interpreted as, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at the evolution a long time, it's just the exponential of some integral between zero and t of something that you collect along the way during by is collected along the way by z in zero to pi, and therefore you end up exactly the, the way this type of thing is going to decay when t goes to zero. It's just you know Gersonov or whatever Feynman cats or whatever type of thing you look at it. It's it's the same type of problem that you have there. So it's just that here you have some u times some other stuff here with some other, maybe some other function here. And so again, this is something you can, you can control well. And again, you know, the eigenfunction will be just be sinus to some power, and, and so everything works out very well. And so in particular, what you end up is that the thing you can compute, you know, you would expect uh, in terms of a radial exploration in order to have four arms will decay like r to the 5 4 But I don't want to spend too much time in, uh, with this because that would, you know, well, anyway, time is out no, today. But uh, the, um, I just wanted to emphasize the, these two, first two ones, the 5 over 48 and the 5 4, just to show that basically it's, you know, in the SLE framework, it's just a simple problem. You have a diffusion in an interval and you look how much, it, how long it takes or what the probability is that it survives for a long time. And it's just the first eigenvalue uh, computation. And even if you are not used to these things, you know, this is very elementary. It's just, you know, you have an upper bound and lower bound, and that's all you need here. And there are, you, you control everything uh, extremely uh, simply. Okay, I will stop now because uh, I promised to stop at 12. And um, uh, I think they want to take a picture. So you should not escape because I've been, you know, uh, recorded for I don't know how many hours now. But you are going to be, have to be in the picture, I understand. No, everybody. So then you can testify how many people were actually sitting in the audience. Uh, 